Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and join us today for the Anatomy of Revival. We're going to talk today about what, what is the end result of revival. Does revival keep on perpetuating revival? No, we're going to find out the end of revival is local churches. Join me today. You're going to be tremendously blessed. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob. That's me. Good to have you on the with the broadcast today. Me to be here with you and uh, you to sit and listen to it. So again, what a great blessing. And if you're here for the first time, watching for the first time, glad you're here. Welcome to this great family we've got of people that watch the broadcast, are growing by it, ministers especially too, students, Bible school students, because that's what I do. I simply take the Word of God and open it up. And I have a teaching gift and I pastored for 33 years and the things that I taught back during those times, I'm bringing out today, and the Word of God never changes. Still is relevant and powerful today, but I do do a little updating on it. So again, uh, that'll be important to you. And uh, to open up with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 19 today. We're going to take up in verse 16. And for the past six lessons, we have been talking about the anatomy of revival. Uh, what does the Word of God have to say about revival? How does it begin? Uh, where is the first uh, indicators God's looking for, for sending revival, bringing revival to an area? And we talked about teamwork, how that it starts with the hunger of an individual or a few individuals. Then God speaks to an individual to go there, that it involves teamwork because revivals never start with just one person. And uh, it takes a group of people that are working together. And you say, yeah, but I know missionaries that go to places and have revival all by themselves. No, it takes a team of people supporting them and uh, partners in, the, in you know, the United States or Great Britain or some other country that give into their ministry. So there's always teamwork involved. And uh, we bring that out in the opening of this. And so that's how this uh, series started. We actually started in chapter 18, the end of the chapter with the teamwork, and then the revival broke out in chapter 19. And the uh, last time we ended with verse 15, and this is the essence of it. The revival started in the opening verses of chapter 19 with the outpouring of the Spirit on 12 men that uh, Paul ran into that were disciples, honestly born again, but weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I brought out in that opening verses of this chapter is that revival begins with open hearts and a turning to or returning to the Holy Spirit where believers who are not Spirit-filled or even people who are Spirit-filled who have turned away from speaking with tongues, the outpouring of the Spirit. There's a return and a hunger to that. We're seeing it in our country today and around the world. There's a hunger for the supernatural, and this is the doorway into the supernatural. And of course, this is how revival broke out at Ephesus with the supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Miracle signs, wonders, people healed. Uh, we have uh, in uh, in the verses around 10, verse 10, 11, 12 in that area where special miracles were done by the hands of Paul from his body were taken handkerchiefs and aprons and taken to the sick and the demon possessed. And as they Laid those uh, The people laid those on the sick and demon-possessed. The evil spirits came out of them. The diseases left them. Great revival has broken out, and literally the entire continent of Asia is going to be shaken by this three-year revival that occurred at Ephesus. And now Paul has been meeting in the school of Tyrannus. And uh, this was a medical school that was taught medical students up until about noon and in the afternoons, the building was open. Paul used it in the afternoons into the evening with services and great outpourings of the spirit, people running throughout the city, seeing people healed, delivered, set free. And then of course we face Paul's opposition in these verses where just before this time, there were seven sons of Sceva, which were, uh, that cast out devils. And uh, they were called exorcists. We're, not, we're never called exorcists because that's a term used for witchcraft. And so we cast out devils. In fact, the term exorcist is only used in this particular chapter. And so they took Paul's uh, formula, basically, they thought it was a formula, and they added the name of Jesus to what their successful one was. And when they did that, then the evil spirit actually spoke against them. And then uh, one man that was demon possessed with one demon attacked all uh, seven of these sons. And before they ever got out of the house, he had stripped all their clothes off of them. They ran out of the house wounded and naked. And so this, the report of this, because these guys were heroes in the city. The people thought these guys were religious uh 
advocates for God and they got them to God. And then they find out when this thing happened that all this time, these guys have been working for the devil. And this is the wake up call that came to the city of Ephesus, that this thing was real. And we see the real turnaround in the city starting in this case. People love the outpouring of the Spirit. They loved healing. They loved signs, wonders, miracles, all this stuff. But when this thing happened, they realized how long they had been deceived by Satan, by witchcraft, and these seven sons of Sceva. And suddenly now they're going to come. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 16. It says here, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. One man leaped on them and then overcame them. They fought back. But this one man was stronger than seven men and prevailed against them. In other words, they fought back, but the demon was stronger than they were and prevailed against them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This was the supernatural power of one demon. One man leaped on seven overcame the strength of seven men and one man prevailed against seven and tore their clothes off before they could reach the front door of the house. And in verse 17, this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Apparently there was a reporter from the Ephesus Gazette outside and saw them running out and took pictures, had it in the paper the next day. This thing spread everywhere. And all of a sudden the heroes of the city became outcast. The people didn't want them anymore. And this is what happened as they came to preaching demonology and they also were preaching, you know, the worship of Diana. And again, it says this went to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling at Ephesus and great reverence fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So the sons of Sceva were exposed. Now everyone knew they were working for Satan and and uh, themselves and, and working for Satan himself. The scales were lifted off their eyes and great reverence for the true God fell on the entire city and the name of Jesus was magnified. What was intended to hurt Christianity entered around helping it. Many unsaved people and backslidden Christians came to the Lord and the ripples of this event went out all over Asia. I'm simply here to tell you what God did in these verses of scripture he wants to do for you. And every time you run into a situation, you start thinking of the worst case scenario. Put your trust in God because God is the only one that can turn the curses of this world and the curses of Satan and turn them around and use them to actually advance us. Many of the things that were designed to destroy me have actually ended up being stepping stones. The same thing is true in your life and that's what happened with the seven sons of Sceva. They came and they were going to cast out this demon, add the name of Jesus to their formula, make their their uh, you know their uh, profession even larger, affect more people, take away the credit from Paul by using it. And all of a sudden, when they use the name of Jesus, this thing, the whole back thing backfired on them. And now they are being exposed in front of the whole city as hypocrites and working for the devil himself. And now the people all over the city come and they're now coming to worship the Lord. They now have there's a whole turn inside of them and. This this is the point right here at this point where revival is going to change. I have been telling you all this time that there is an end to revival. The end result of revival is not more revival. What's going to happen after this is we're going to see suddenly Paul's going to be thrust out of the city. The whole city is going to turn, the business community is going to turn against uh, Paul and his workers. The population of the city has turned more toward the Lord Jesus Christ than ever before, but the business crowd is having their business affected. We will come up with that in just a moment. Moment. It goes on to say in verse 18, many who believed came. These are believers or carnal believers. Now, these are either new believers who haven't turned loose of witchcraft because they didn't know there's anything really wrong with witchcraft, but it says they came and then confessed and showed their deeds. So believers who are out of fellowship with the Lord, maybe had been saved for some time in Ephesus, but no longer stood up for the Lord, came and repented because they had been working and dabbling in witchcraft. And so they repented of their fear and apathy toward the things of God, but also many who had just been saved, but still dabbling in witchcraft came and confessed their sins of involvement with witchcraft and sorcery because now they've seen it as of the devil. What they thought these seven sons of Sceva were and what the seven sons of Sceva represented was really demonic. They didn't know it. Now that it's been exposed, notice what happened. It's in verse 19. Many of them also, which used curious arts, this is magic, brought their books together and burned them in public before everybody. And they counted the price of them and found it about 50,000 pieces of silver. I can't find today anything close to what that was the worth of today's in today's society. But can you imagine 50,000 pieces of silver? 
And so they brought, that's why all this was worth. And think about this. These books taught witchcraft, demon worship, seances, occult operations. This burning was a monument of their renewed lives. In other words, before this, they repented in their heart. Now they came and burned all their books and openly repented in front of everybody for what they had been following and showed that burning these books, witchcraft stops here. From this point on, up and before this time, there has been witchcraft in our city. I'm sure there was still some witchcraft in the city, but what the people said as a whole that came in front of this gigantic group burning their books was simply this, it stops here. From now on, we are worshiping and serving the true and living God. Understand this, that this burning was a monument to their renewed lives. And understand this also, these books were handwritten. There was no printing presses back there. They had been handed down from generation to generation, passing them on from uh, parents to children to the next generations after that. But they simply said, we have now figured something out. All this stuff is lies. It's based on the father of lies, on Satan. And they came and burned them in front of everybody. This is not a government doing it, as in many cases around the world when communism comes in and books of the past are burned. This is a case where they're saying, this stuff is totally wrong. We repent of it. It's of the devil. We are now serving God. And in verse 20, now coming up, we now have the turning point of the revival from one man named Paul to thousands of believers in Ephesus. And now we're going to find that God's going to raise up churches. What does it say in verse 20? This is the turning point of the revival right here. Up until now, signs, wonders, miracles, signs, wonders, miracles. Has it been preaching by Paul? Yes, but it's probably on healing, signs, wonders, and miracles. But what's going to happen now is because the people have now suddenly seen all this. Now, Paul knows it's the time to begin to trust people with the carrying on because one man has never been designed by God to introduce revival and then carry it on. One man can come in and bring and help bring in revival with a group around him. But now Paul sees this thing has gone far beyond what he's capable of, far beyond what his team is capable of. And now it's again going to be taken on from here. And the end result, understand this, the end result of revival is not more revival. The end result of revival is local churches, people by the hundreds of thousands doing the work of what Paul did and understanding this. Paul came out and we revered him. He was incredible, wonderful. You know what? He could lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And you know what they're beginning to find out now? We can do the same thing. The same authority given to Paul, even though Paul operated a gift, even though Paul operated in this ministry of the apostle coming in to do these things, yet what he did himself also, that authority has been handed on to Christians. And we can go out and lay hands on the sick. In fact, it's part of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This was written to all Christians, not just to pastors, evangelists, and prophets. It's given to all believers. And now this is being handed off to the people, and churches are being established so the people can learn of this each and every week. Churches are designed to take believers and to grow them in the things of God, to turn con converts into disciples. And that's what we're going to find out now. Beginning in verse 20, the big shift happens in Ephesus. And the church is going to become one of the largest in the world. In fact, it said in one time that the church probably numbered up to 70,000 people. We'll talk about this more when we come back. And you can find out about my book on Acts so that you can find out too about the revival that went on, but how it applies to you today. See you right after the break. At the dawn of the church age, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and power to his followers. From Pentecost, they were led by his Spirit to blaze a trail through the hazardous maze of pagan cultures and religious legalism. Like wildfire, the gospel spread through the known world, bringing salvation to a whole generation and triumph and trial to the church. In a New Testament commentary on Acts, Bob Yannian explores the exploits of those sent to uproot the binding vines of religion and philosophy and to sow the kingdom of God. Through evaluations of early congregations and detailed descriptions of their cities, Pastor Bob walks us through the exciting, perilous adventure of the early church. Order a New Testament commentary on Acts at bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, 
election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Here in verse 20, it says again, this is the turning point of the revival in Ephesus. Remember again, up until now, what has grown immensely is signs, wonders, and miracles, these visible things to help bring people to the point of salvation. But now in verse 20, where the uh, seven sons of Sceva have been exposed and the people now realize it and great reverence for God has fallen all over the entire city. And now the people are beginning to understand something. This new birth is just an entrance. There's gotta be something beyond this point, And this is the whole thing. In fact, during this time, we don't know it till chapter 20 coming up next, is during this time, while this revival has been going on, Paul has been taking believers, finding those with maturity, finding those who want to grow and been training them to take over churches. This will not come out till chapter 20. All this time, we're not told this in chapter 19, but below the surface, this is happening. And so in verse 20, we now have the point where the revival turns from signs, wonders, and miracles, casting out devils, all these wonderful things, but now doctrine has to come in. Teaching has to come in. Jesus said in chapter eight of the book of John to those uh, Jews that just believed in him while he was preaching, it says many believed on him. And Jesus said to those Jews, which just believed on him, he said, now, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Being born again is starting in the word. But after we start in the word of God, now we need to continue in the word of God. And he says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? And you'll know the truth. The truth is the word of God. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You say, but I am free when I got born again. Yes, you are spiritually, but to be free in your outward life, in your thinking, in your reacting toward the world, to have biblical standards to fall back on is not bondage. It is freedom like you've never known before. I'm free when I get born again because I'm free from Satan's power. But as far as the influence of the world, 30, 40 years of thinking the way the world does and now having to renew my mind, that's where the word of God comes. Faith for the unbeliever is in Jesus, but faith for the believer is in the word of God. The object of faith for a sinner is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus is the object of your faith. Once you're born again, now the object of your faith is the word of God, and that comes by studying, or as it says in Romans chapter 12, the renewing of your mind. So if this is the turning point in verse 20 for thousands of believers in Ephesus. And now there's going to be the setting up of local churches. In verse 20, here's what we find. Verse 20, so, so means thus, or in the same way, mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, it gained strength. Up until now, what has prevailed? Signs, wonders, and miracles. They've been gaining strength all through this chapter and they hit a culminating point where all of a sudden people begin to understand something. This thing is huge. And even Paul realized this thing is huge. I and my crew can no longer manage this thing. It has to be managed by people we turn it over to, and that's going to be pastors. The word of God started out far behind the power and might of Diana and the religion of Ephesus. Through the period of three years, the word continued to grow until it overcame and prevailed and signs, wonders, and miracles were growing until it overcame and prevailed. The analogy is to the demon who overcame odds seven times worse than himself. He first jumped on the seven, overcame them, then prevailed. The word of God began against incredible odds, but over a period of time, it now has the upper hand in Asia and the signs and wonders were added to power, an addition of power to get the word out. The purpose of signs and wonders is to confirm the word. Now the people are willing to do what is necessary to change their lives and that of others. They're ready for discipleship. And in verse 21, we now find something. 
at verse 21, now Paul has determined he's going to pass through Macedonia, come out of it, head to Achaia and go to Jerusalem. And after that, he's going to go to Rome. He now realizes now is the time to turn this over to pastors. And after three years, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I have to take a break. So this revival has been going on for three years without Paul having any time to take any time off. So much has been going on. The city is so huge. So many things have been going on with the uh, synagogue of the Jews, with the people on the streets, with the people in their homes with the seven sons of Sceva. And now it's come to this point where all of a sudden the whole city is taking note of the power of God because not only has the truth been exposed, but also the falseness has been exposed. Satanic things have been exposed. The lie has been exposed. And the people now realize we need some more besides this. And that's where pastors have to come in. So again, the end result of revival is not more revival. The end result of revival is local churches. We find in our own country, after revival, it happens for a while. It lasts for maybe 10, 12 years, something like that. And in this case, three years. Why the Azusa revival only lasted four years, five years at the max. And after that, what happened? Churches, denominations were formed, churches being built everywhere. This is the end result of revival. Revival does not bring stability to a city. Oftentimes revival brings instability. It brings riots into a city where, where unbelievers are rioting against the truth. And the thing keeps going till it reaches a pinnacle point. And then after that's over, God sets up churches. Because why? Churches help to bring and restore stability to a city. Only this time it is God-centered and not religion-centered. It is righteousness-centered and not evil or sinful centeredness as it has been up until now. As these things were ended, again, in verse 21, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul's ministry was not ended in Ephesus. He would return after a probably a year and admonish the pastors of the churches of the city, which had been formed and operating during that year. That's coming up in the next chapter, chapter 20. This is an introduction at the end of chapter 19 into chapter 20, because again, the end of result of revival is churches and Paul is going to sit with a multitude of pastors from Ephesus. What had been fulfilled by the signs and wonders, these had all been done and they've now done their job by promoting the word of God and the importance of the word of God to the place of overcoming the opposition of religion, which is demons and Satan himself. And although the miracles, the signs and wonders had been fulfilled, they were not over. It's gonna switch from Paul and his team now to the members of the body of Christ, where there was one Paul and probably seven or eight helping him at that time, We're now having to have thousands of people who attend the local church, which is in men at homes at that time. And now they're going out in the streets and they're doing the same thing. They're laying hands on the sick and the demon possessed, seeing them delivered, leading them to the Lord. And now they've been coming to church and the churches are going to grow exponentially. It's all called one church in Ephesus, but they met in homes everywhere. And at one time, it's estimated there were 70,000 people attending the church in Ephesus in many locations. So again, many more miracles and signs were performed in the days to come, but they were being accomplished by the individual saints in the churches. God's best is for believers to perform the miracles, not just the evangelist or the prophet or the apostle that comes in and starts a work. God's best is for the people to receive their needs met by standing on the word of God for themselves. And this is taught by the local churches who instruct the people in the word. The majority of people are still going to be one on the streets, but now we also have churches where people can be one to the Lord. Paul knows his own time was coming to an end and he'll have to leave for a while. And now he purposes by the direction of the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. And it will be God's will for him at that time to go to Rome. Verse 22 says this, so he sent into Macedonia two of them who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed, this is at Ephesus for a season. Erastus is a Corinthian believer. He came to see the Corinthian situation and report back to Paul, resulting in the letter sent there. Romans 16, 23 says Erastus was a chamberlain, a member of the city council in Corinth, and Paul will stay with Erastus for a short time and a short period of time to comfort him and the saints who have been experiencing opposition and tribulation for the sake of the gospel. Right now, Ephesus seems to be a heaven on earth, a place where revival is spreading, but all that's behind the scenes, there's also 
satanic opposition and where the city as a whole gave themselves over to the gospel and gave themselves over to God. What we find here is a bunch of businessmen who have been losing money during that time. And so uh, look at verse 23 at the same time, at the same time, what? When the seven sons of Sceva were exposed and revival is in the city and the people, great reverence fell on the entire town, fear about God, reverence toward him, understanding that Satan all this time that we thought he was God, now we realize he's the opposer. And the seven sons of Sceva helped him to understand that. That's what it means here in verse 23. During the same time is the word is increasing while the opposition of Satan has now gone behind the scenes and will be increasing from there. The Lord is always uh, working and his word is always under attack in the life of a believer, a city, or a church. The way in this verse of scripture, notice what it said again, in the same time there arose no small stir about that way. The word way was another way for a name for Christianity. It came from the fact that Jesus said, I am the way. So the church is called the way because we introduce him to the way who is Jesus Christ. And in verse 24, here it says, and here's the opposition for me behind the scenes because a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver statues for Diana brought no small gain. Let's just turn that around. It brought huge profits to the craftsmen. Demetrius is the head of the crafts union in Ephesus. This huge organization was made up of silver miners, craftsmen, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and those that handle the statues. And I mean, from large stores to small places, because again, this is the city where there was so much uh, satanic worship, but also uh, to me, it's like Las Vegas. Again, sex was everywhere. Worship of Diana in the temple involved sex, and they had prostitutes that were there, the most beautiful women, the most handsome men for the women. I mean, this and, and adultery and sexual fornication was just a way of life. And so people came from everywhere and had their big, uh, you know, big conventions there. And when they left, they always wanted to buy a statue of, of Diana to take it home to remember the great sexual time they had there. And so again, all of a sudden, here's what's happening though. Nobody's buying silver statues. They're on the, they're on this, they're on, they're collecting dust on the shelves. And whether it's large stores or small stores, I mean, you can see the clothes coming in and out, people buy, but the silver statues were staying there. And all of a sudden, Demetrius's business is going, you know, belly up. And all these men are facing times where they're going to be laid off. And so Demetrius has an entire meeting of the entire organization, the entire crafts union is meeting, all the heads of the different departments are all there. And he's going to start and incite a riot against Paul and say something something that Paul never did. He's been preaching against Diana. Paul never preached against Diana. He might, he preached against religion, but probably never mentioned the name of Diana, but they're going to accuse him of that. And they're going to start a riot within the city. And so notice again, when Satan can't work as he normally does, he has to get on the outside and cause opposition and cause turmoil and chaos. And that's what's going to happen through the remainder of this chapter. Yet God's still going to work. Only this time he's going to work through some government leaders. Listen, just leave the door open for God to work any way he wants to. Put your trust in him because you probably couldn't figure out how God's going to deliver you, but he will. I'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same station. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.